Welcome to the Kupinger Coal Analyst Chat. I'm your host. My name is Matthias Reinwart. I'm the director of the Practice Identity and Access Management here at Kupinger Coal Analysts. My guest today is Alejandro Leal. He is research analyst with Kupinger Coal. Hi, Alejandro. Good to have you. Hi, Matthias. Thank you for having me back. Great to have you back. We are in a set of episodes running up to an event that we are planning for November in Frankfurt, which will be called Cyber Revolution or Cyber Evolution. Um, so you can choose. And we are working on topics around the intersection of artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. So this is one of the focuses also of the event. And we are, want to talk today a bit more about what we have done already in other episodes, together with Warwick and Marina Yantono. Um, and we want to talk about future threats and how new technologies, of course, machine learning, artificial intelligence, have an impact on cybersecurity. Uh, what is your main threat that you currently see and that you're currently working on? Yes, well, it's a very cool topic. And I'm afraid that there are plenty of cybersecurity threats out there that are continuously evolving and getting more sophisticated. Thankfully, we uh, here at Coping Your Call, we're going to be covering some of these threats in the coming months. And like you said, especially during the Cyber Revolution Conference that will take place in November of this year. So as we know, over the past decade, we have seen uh, rapid development in the field of information technology. And we can even say that there has been a sort of digital revolution that has provided unprecedented benefits to society and the economy. It has also created new ways for businesses to interact with employees and their customers. However, uh, these developments have also created some uh, challenges. Cybersecurity threats have been increasing over the past years. And Recently, the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity published a report called Cybersecurity Threats for 2030. And one of the threats mentioned in the report happens to be deep fakes. Uh, and that's the topic that I will discuss today in this podcast. I'm currently working on a blog post that will be published sometime um, this week or next week on the website. And there are two potential ways that deepfakes can be used by adversaries. One of them is the remote identity proofing attack, and the other one is a disinformation campaign. So the global pandemic underlined the importance of having well-regulated identity proofing services and trusted digital identities that public and private organizations can rely on. The shift to work from anywhere and remote work accelerated this trend and the need for identity proofing services. So what, what is remote identity proofing? And essentially, it's the process when a user proves his or her identity uh, the, the process usually goes like this. The user takes the webcam or the mobile device and the user then shows their face. And at the same time, they produce a government issued document, either a legal identity card or a passport. Uh, however, uh, criminals or adversaries are getting more creative in the ways they could circumvent these systems. The manipulation of visual media is being enabled by the widespread availability of sophisticated image and video editing tools, as well as automated manipulation algorithms that permit editing in ways that are very difficult to detect and distinguish from a real footage, let's say. While many manipulations are benign, they are mainly performed for fun or just for artistic value. Others are for more adversarial purposes, let's say, such as the spread of propaganda or disinformation campaigns. And that is when it becomes a problem. Um, but when it comes to the identity proofing service attack, it's necessary first to understand what uh, deep fakes are. 
And deep fakes are manipulated media. It could be a video, it could be a voice recording, or simply a photo of a targeted person. This data is fed to um, a program that will learn the fundamental traits of the target person, of the victim. And this program then will use the information learned to modify the photo, the video, the recording, and then apply these traits on the face of the victim. Um, so deepfake software can create a synthetic video or image that realistically represents anyone in the world, and it can be very difficult to distinguish from a real footage. So for identity proofing, this kind of attack is particularly used against the video evidence based identity proofing system. So for example, if the attacker knows the steps of the process, they can simply inject the video or they can present the video on a screen. So the, he or she can fool both the automated system and a system which uses an operator. So it's worth noting, however, that deep fakes attacks, they can only happen two ways. One is either by being presented to the camera or by being injected into the camera flow. So addressing the challenges posed by deep fakes in identity proofing requires an approach that involves a combination of tools such as robust authentication mechanisms and continuous adaptation because deep fakes are continuously evolving in sophistication, so it's necessary to continuously adapt to this threat. Right. I've been talking to, to John Torbert, our colleague, about uh, about FRIP platforms. I think the technologies that, that are used there are also closely related to that, what you just highlighted. And it's always also a... Um, 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 a process of, as you said, an improvement on the on the attacker side, an improvement on the on the um, on the cybersecurity professional side. Um, but these technologies, they are built into services because I see as an advisor that many organizations are currently looking into these platforms to improve um, actually their their onboarding processes, for example, or to improve their their customer onboarding process. So both employees and customers are, are typical use cases here. Do, do you see a, a rapid involvement? evolving um, also in the in the technologies used here? Yes, absolutely. I recent well, last year I published the LC on passwordless authentication. You and I had a conversation on the topic. Exactly. And one of the trends that I observed was the use of, uh, let's say, blockchain technology to improve this onboarding process that will increase both security and convenience. So I, I see that organizations are catching on these trends and they're integrating new technologies to combat emerging cybersecurity threats. And I think the difference between the, the, the two types of attacks that I will talk about today is that on the one hand, the identity proofing attack, it's not very, uh, let's say, fancy. You don't really see that on the news. Maybe people in our industry, we know about it, but what we see more on the news and, and maybe people that are not in the industry are aware of are the disinformation campaign attacks. Uh, so deep fakes can be used to create false videos of political figures, let's say, candidates or public figures. For example, the case of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, there was a deep fake video that appeared last year where he was saying basically that the soldiers need to surrender to the Russian troops. And of course, that proved to be fake. But there was also another video in 2019 that showed back then U.S. House of Representatives Nancy Pelosi, where she appeared to be intoxicated in the video. And more recently, there was lots of content generated after the Burkina Faso coup that happened this year. And there was lots of information out there, deep fake content basically supporting the military junta that is uh, ruling the country right now. So it could be used for political purposes, but it can also be used to create realistic news stories. So fabricated content can be hard to distinguish, and then maybe some news outlet could use it to create a news story. 
but then the people that are going to be reading about it are going to be confused and it could also create some division and undermine trust in the media. Deepfake campaigns can also be used for manipulating uh, cultural narratives or in a way rewriting history. For example, it's possible to alter historical footage or some iconic speeches from public figures. Uh, they can be distorted and then the public's understanding of a significant event can be also confusing. And I think finally, another example of disinformation campaigns are related to financial fraud. So many fraudsters and cyber criminals are using voice manipulation to impersonate someone in a phone call. And they can trick individuals or organizations into providing uh, sensitive information. So detecting, detecting and countering deepfakes along with promoting media literacy and critical thinking are essential to uh, mitigating disinformation tactics. Right. You've mentioned media, media literacy. That That is, of course, of importance. Is this really something that I would expect to happen, A? And B, can I find a, a trustworthy source that confirms what I've just seen? But also from a technology, technology perspective, are there tools in place? Are there organizations, vendors working on detection mechanisms that aid in the detection of these um, uh, fake videos, fake pictures, and maybe even fake audio? Yes. Uh, recently, there have been some countermeasures that are useful to combat these emerging threats. And one of them is uh, media forensics. So, for example, in the United States, the DARPA agency, which stands for the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, they recently created two programs, one called the Media Forensics and the other one called the Semantics Forensics. And what they're trying to do is to understand how deep fakes are created, how they're made, how they spread, and how can they detect uh, and distinguish between a real content and a fabricated one. So the United States is taking some measures by creating programs, but there are also tools that we can, that organizations can integrate, for example, machine learning and AI tools that can counter deep fakes. And like we mentioned, uh, public awareness and education. Like for example, a few years ago, there was some, let's say, generational gap between the older and the younger ones because an example, I don't know, like my, my grandma, for example, she would write me on WhatsApp telling me about, oh, you saw this story on, on, on the news. And I, I think that maybe younger generations are able to distinguish between what's false and what's real, let's say. But when it comes to deep fakes, I think that's transcending generations like anyone could fall for uh deep fake and since this technology is currently evolving and getting better then it's going to be more challenging in the future and um, yeah maybe another technical thing that we can do to to distinguish content could be digital watermarking so essentially i think it's important to note that the field of deep fakes is evolving rapidly and countermeasures are needed to continuously adapt to the new techniques and advancements and, and the threats that cyber criminals are creatively doing. Uh, so I think we need a sort of multifaceted approach that combines technical tools, public awareness and education, and also policy developments and legal frameworks that can effectively mitigate the risk associated with deepfakes. Right, I, I would fully agree. But but um, again, uh, I had the same discussion earlier with with Marina when we say, okay, we all are looking into regulation as, as one of the key components uh, of mitigating that risks, and that is obviously true. But the the attackers, they don't care about regulations. They will be unhinged. They will be using that. So the the level of of control, the level of mitigating measures that we apply to to get hold of these deep fakes will be even more substantial and will be even more in, uh, desperately needed to protect society and news and businesses from from the outcome the fallout of those uh, those deep fakes and i think that discussion we will um, continue at cyber evolution um, but also um, running up to that event uh, i think um, our website our blog as you've just written for that will be um, a valuable source and if there are any questions from the audience regarding that topic, 
if you want to get into a closer discussion with with you Alejandro if with with me or with the team that is doing cybersecurity research here at Kupinger Cole and advisory um, just leave a comment below that video on YouTube or if you're listening or watching this or on any other platform use the mechanisms that are in there or just write an email this still works and and no risk of deep fakes in emails at least not no easy ones um, thank you very much Alejandro for your time being here today for um, laying out your expertise in in deep fakes in cybersecurity I think this will stay with us for quite some time will maybe never go away but we need to be really um yeah we need to take care that these things don't interrupt us a pope in a fancy um, um dress might be funny but this is just one aspect of the of the medal thanks alejandro for being my guest today and looking forward to having you soon again thank you matthias thank you bye